James is uh, going to outline the uh, position for the uh, defender guardian position, focusing on our argument of improved pin tests. Violated 660 
and 678 and 1441 of the Security Council. Now, the, the Iraq War was a just and necessary intervention which enables an incurably better alternative to leaving Saddam Hussein in place. Leaving him in place would have led to uh, more uh, genocide upon his own people um, and an di evil dictator that was um, ruled with an iron fist would have been left uh, with infinite resources to, to carry on as he was. When the government entered Iraq war, they did so with the intention to remove Saddam. They did not, and arguably did not foresee the death toll which would amount from the invasion upon Iraq citizens. Uh, they could not have, uh, in my opinion, or uh, my submission, uh, foreseen uh, the intention to commit genocide in that case. Uh, the Journal of Peace Research from 2006, where Nicholas March stated, there is a little sense of how one should weigh up the benefits of uh, the democraticizing uh, against the inevitable cost of warfare. So the cost of uh, giving the country a democracy against the cost of the warfare and the lives that were lost between civilians. There's no way of uh, judging that. Uh, how, how do we measure the, the, the value of a country's independence against the value of defeating an aggressive regime uh, while defending independence? How, how do we do that? How do we justify that? Uh, so many people were killed, that's a genocide. Um, but at the same time, they've been given independence um, and freedom within their country, which is far greater than they ever had under uh, a, ty a tyranny dictator such as the uh, Southern Saint. <clears throat> Sometimes there uh, is a justification for opposing tyranny and barbarism, whatever the cost. Whatever the cost, whatever the cost, there is a there is a justification for opposing a dictator such as Saddam Hussein, who uh, continues with barbarism and uh, um, you know ruling his country like a, a dictator as he was. Um, and certainly, had I been alive and old enough at the time, uh, I would have personally stood against uh, the Nazi regime. Um, and I would have um, you know, wished to remove uh, Hitler at that time as well, through whatever cost. Uh, and certainly we did that as well uh, in this country at that time, and that was acceptable then. Um, it is thus the defence's submission that, given the severity of the tyranny uh, on the Iraqi civilians endured under the uh, dictator Saddam Hussein, the civilian life was justifiable, and the war was justifiable, and the, the alleged genocide would amount to being justifiable. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Gary. Yes. Commissioners, uh, James, and Ron Cook, for the uh, government's position. Um, now I think we turn to the panel to uh, ask any questions they may have of uh, Mr. Calvadale or the uh, government's position. I wanted to get a with uh, Chris. How do you feel? I wanted to question. Uh, oh, well, a question. Uh, sorry, I was talking James. James. Um, <coughs> you said whatever the cost. Yeah. If the cost is uh, being unlawful, surely that is not realistic. Um, assessment. Yeah, but I mean, this is the issue we're having, isn't it? It's, you say the word unlawful, but... Um, it's our position that the war was lawful. Um, but, but, but if, uh, by taking those actions, the, the knowledge stick was going to affect uh, human civilian casualties on a mass scale, therefore one must outweigh the other, surely, when it comes to that. Well, that, that was the submission that that is actually a, an impossible thing to do. Um, it's, it's not practical. How is that impossible? I mean, we know, we know that if you drop a missile, anyone within that area, it's going to be within an area of that missile going off will be killed. So yeah, um, but so if if that, I guess I would answer that by saying if that one missile achieved the outcome of uh, removing Saddam Hussein, but it didn't, did it? But, if, but if, if it removed the part of his uh, regime, uh, it must be justifiable. 
but it wasn't just one missile, it wasn't um, subversive operations, it was direct operations against innocent civilians. None of the, the, this uh, bombing was intentionally uh, against civilians. It was no, I don't think it's different. If we, if we look at some of the footage she went through with WikiLeaks, we see that some of that is direct bombing of this disability. Um, and I've seen some of the um, WikiLeaks footage, especially from helicopter pilots. Um, you know, that, that is undefensible. Um, they, they are specific uh, war crimes committed by individual soldiers. And these, these soldiers are taking their directives from the control. That control for that war machine that's taking place at that time must be culpable because the action has been given, the order has been given, and, and, and the results of that action, as you've just said yourself, are indefensible. Mm. Um, you know, uh, individual actions like that, uh, they, they would be prosecuted by the government, and if they in fact did uh, commit a war crime, they will be dealt with through the military courts. The question is, so that doesn't the, excuse it. When the government are, are putting their stamp on actions that are culpable of war crime, then they by their actions are all problems by allowing those atrocities to happen in the first place. That may be true to say, but uh, with any war, uh, there is un unfortunately as it is likely to be individuals that do uh, go on above and beyond uh, their call of duty, so to speak, and those should be dealt with uh, individually as, as and when they occur. But to say then that every military campaign uh, conducted by the government is unlawful because that will happen and we know that will happen, uh, I don't think it's a, a fair submission. But if we have a warship, the warship is launching tonical missiles into an area, and we know, anyone in this room knows, that there can be no guarantees to exactly who will be killed once that missile lands. So therefore it's indiscriminate, it's not specific to target, it's indiscriminate. Yeah, I, th I think the uh, government's position on that would be uh, <coughs> the uh, technology is getting better all the time, so uh, they're becoming more and more uh, strategic. And we, you know, we now know more and more about these kind of missiles. And, and the cost of what? They do, they're becoming more uh, precise. And what are people's lives? Well, what are people? Are they the guinea pigs for you? The military to test out how effective their weapons are, especially the manufacturing side. I think we've got a couple of other questions there. Any questions for us, men? In this, to Jane, or to Chris? Yes, to Chris. Um, just a question that um, to distinguish genocide from mass murder, you said that um, there has to be a national, ethnic, racial, and religious um, motivation behind behind those killings. Um, do you think, in the context of the Iraq War, that was the motivation, or do you not think perhaps it's more to do with economic motivation? Um, and so then, if that was not the case, would it still be genocide? Uh, no, this is based. I'm not interpreting people's uh, motivation. This is a factual statement based on the perpetrator killed members of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And that's anybody a factual... You kill, anybody you kill would have a nationality, but to distinguish it between murder and genocide, so a racially intended... Is that, is that correct? Is that what genocide would be? Uh, yeah, it has to be all four of the criteria. So what yeah. we have to do in order to split the, um, the crime down into its components, say the legislators have said it has four main components. And if A, and if B, and if C, and if D, then you can convict someone of genocide. But if it's A, B, not C, and D, you can't convict them of genocide. So it's the way the legislation is laid out that determines the factual basis. And what has to be proved in court, and can be proved, is that 110,000 nationals of Iraq were killed. 